Thank you for joining Jennifer Shelton Associates in our 2019 webinar Wednesday series. We are coming to you live from downtown Washington, D.C. Our webinars are every Wednesday, and you can find the upcoming schedule on our website. Past webinars and all recordings are also on our website and on our YouTube channel, along with over 160 other recordings on federal contracting topics. All are complimentary. If you have questions for our speaker today, you can email her directly with the contact information you'll see on the last slide. All right, just a little bit about us. We are Washington, D.C.-based firm that provides services for federal contractors. This ranges from market analysis reports to a closure writing and also post-award compliance. More information is on our website, so please visit us. These are a few upcoming events that you can find more information on this slide or also on our website. And we now offer advertising, and you can contact me if you want more information. And our webinar today is sponsored by AccuTrack, and here's a short message from them. AccuTrack Consulting and Accounting Services is an 8A WOSB CPA firm committed to supporting entities sustain growth in government contracting. Our outstanding BCAA accounting solutions reduce audit risk, improve cash flow, and give you peace of mind. Contact us today to learn how we can enhance your BCAA accounting efforts. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Our speaker today is Johanna Reed, and we're going to be covering cybersecurity under the DFAR. And Jody, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Good afternoon. I hope many of you were at the earlier session because it's going to be kind of a little bit of a pickup from where we were this morning. So the next slide. So we talked about this morning FISMA, and that's how you're going to hear it referred to most of the time. The first FISMA was Federal Information Security Management Act of 2002, and the second one was the Federal Information Security Modernization Act of 2014. The 2014 Act mostly replaced the 2002, although there'll be a few things that you might end up going back to referring in the 2002. So what does FISMA do? Basically, it imposed basic information security requirements upon federal agencies and many contractors that have been fleshed out in much greater detail by the policies and standards issued by the Office of Management and Budget and in the National Institute of Standards and Technology. You'll hear both, especially NIST and OMB, anytime you hear anything talking about cybersecurity. Unfortunately, only the Department of IS has really issued procurement regulations regarding the imposition of the basic information security requirements on its contractors. Next slide. There are basically two, two DFARS clauses. First one, DFARS 252-204-7008, is really the one that gets included in RFPs. Then the second one, the dash 70112, is the one that actually applies once you have a contract. When you submit a proposal and the DFARS clause 252-204-7008 is listed in your RFP, you are essentially saying that you are compliant with that clause. Next slide. The 7008, and this is how you'll usually hear them referred to, is simply as the last four dishes. The 7008 clause was issued in October 2016, and it came about after a couple, after one interim clause that had an earlier date, um, and also some preliminary clauses that they kind of went through and, and got a lot of comments back and rejected. It basically required offers to represent that it will implement NIST 800-171 standards that are in effect at the time the solicitation is issued, but no later than December 31st, 2017. It required the security requirements required by 252-204-7012 to be implemented for all covered defense information on all covered contractor information systems that support the performance of the contract. Next slide. So what are these things? So all of the clauses, control technical information, um, covered contract information, covered defense information, cyber incident, they're all defined in the 7012 clause, which we will talk about in a few minutes. They also talk about in this clause is that, once again, it refers to the 7012 for all covered defense information, same difference. This is covering 
As your proposal, you're saying that you're going to be compliant when you execute the contract. Next slide. <coughs> and once again, it's by submission of this offer you represent you are compliant with 800-171. And if the, since we're now past the December 31st, 2017 date, any proposals you submit to DOD in which you have this clause, you are essentially, as soon as you submit that offer, saying you are compliant with the clause. But the big question that comes about still is do you have to be compliant with the clause? And that's a different question. Unfortunately, um, as I talked about earlier today, the training in this area is lacking, both from a program side and from a contracting officer side. So what you will see is the clause included in a contract and nowhere else in the contract do they talk about what, what information actually has to be protected. Next slide. There is an opportunity to indicate that you're not going to be compliant. And certainly if you see the clause in a contract, um, you can respond back and ask what information has to be protected. Because not your entire system doesn't have to be protected. Only that protects that portion that contains the con the the contract the uh, contract information or the CUI. Um, this is interesting applicable to commercial contracts. It is arguably also applicable to cost contracts if they are included in the cost thing. And if you are including cost products in a proposal to the government, you need to be very careful when it comes to this, this clause. There has been at least one GAO protest in which the government reviewed a contractor's um, proposal, saw that they were using a COTS software product, but in their proposal did not say how they were going to address cybersecurity concerns, and this was one of the requirements of the contract with cybersecurity, um, with the COTS product. And they lost, they lost the contract award, they protested, and the GAO said, "If you, the clause is applicable. It might not be applicable to cost stuff. However, you have to address how you're going to deal with security issues that might be raised or caused by that cost product. Something to be thinking about. Disclose, disclose, disclose. So if you have a cost product, and in your proposal, you." We're going to assume that your rest of your system is compliant, but you're now going to have a COTS product in there. You need to tell the government how you're dealing with that COTS product as part of your proposal to make sure that the entire system and the integrity and the cybersecurity of the entire system is not compromised. Next slide. And basically, an authorized representative of the Department of Defense Chief Information Office will adjudicate those offer requests to have a variance from this SP-800-171. If you get a variance, this seems very obvious, but I see this every day, make sure that it's included in your contract what that variance is. Next slide. So the meaty clause. First of all, compromise. Unlike our current government here, compromise in this situation is bad. Basically, a compromise is if you have a disclosure of information to an unauthorized person, if you have a violation of your security policy, whether it's intentional or unintentional, if you have modification, destruction, or loss of an object, or if you have copying of the information to unauthorized media. Um, I love reading Dilbert, and I love uh, reading things about the pony hair boss, where he finds a stick out on his desk and now he uses it and basically loads malware into the entire company system. It's a comic strip, but I will tell you this happens every single day. 
the number one issue with cybersecurity continues to be the employees of a company doing, quite frankly, stupid stuff. Um, I used to work at BAE Systems, and I just wanted to strangle some people who would get a malware via a um, email, and then they would hit reply all to tell people that there was malware on that email so that they could spread it to everyone. And it happens every single day in some of the most sophisticated companies out there. It is an ongoing problem. Next slide. Contractor proprietary information. So does that mean if you are a contractor that all of your proprietary information um, has to be compliant, your systems that hold that be compliant with the 8171? The answer to that is actually no. What does have to be compliant is if you say, for example, you're a CETA contractor, systems engineering, technical assistance contractor, and you have on your computer system access to other companies' proprietary information properly, um, and you have it on your system, then your system has to be 800-171 compliant. Keeping in mind, and this is where people forget to go, they'll say, well, I don't keep any information on my system. I'm like, well, do you get emails? Well, yeah. Do you get technical information in the emails that, that's proprietary to companies? Yeah. Well, guess what? You have proprietary information on your system. Generally, you'll hear things talk about controlled unclassified information. And what the DOD and their DFARS clause did is they added something called Controlled Technical Information, or CTI. And it's basically information with a military or space application that's subject to the controls on access, use, reproduction, modification, performance, display, release, disclosure, or dissemination. Controlled Technical Information meets the criteria if, next slide, it is disseminated for distribution statements B through F. Distribution statement A in the DOD instruction is publicly available information. So a covered contract information system is an unclassified system that is owner operated by or for a contractor and that processes, stores, or transmits covered defense information. So if you are a DOD contractor, odds are you can have your systems contain controlled technical information or they may contain covered defense information which is controlled unclassified or CUI. Next slide. We're going to talk more about CUI in a couple of about a minute or so. The big thing here is that it has to be marked or identified in the contract task order or delivery order and provided to the contractor by or on behalf of DOD. What's interesting about this is it has to be identified in the contract. I looked at a fair number of contracts and I have yet to see it be specifically identified in many contracts. I will tell you I used to work on some programs in which we did have CUI and it was identified, and, it, and it's identified at a top level. It's not the specific information, but it's identified as information like, so to speak. Um, next slide. Cyber incident. Um, it's anything that takes and has an impact on your computer network that is results in a compromise or an actual or potentially adverse effect on an information system. So you get the hacker that gets into your system just to see if they can, that's considered a compromise. If they get into your system and they actually do something, it's an actual impact. Both are considered a cyber incident. Technical information is pursuant to the DFARS clause. Some examples, next slide, include research and engineering data, engineering drawings, associated lists, specifications, standards, process sheets, manuals, technical reports, technical, blah, blah, blah. 
So you get an idea how much is this. But what's important here is what is not in the DFARS clause, but it is considered to be technical information for pursuing to cybersecurity, is computer software executable code and so source code. Normally that's under the Dash 14 clause, but for purposes of determining and defining cyber um, technical information, it is concluded in this clause here. Next slide. So, to summarize, it doesn't include all DOD contracts, although my guess is all DOD and contracts now include the clauses. It should only be applied to cover defense information. It's a self-certification that you meet all 110 standards in NIST SP 800-171. It was required to be implemented as of December 31st, 2017. It has a requirement that you report cyber incidents to the U.S. government, to the CERT, which we talked about earlier today, within 72 hours. And there's a mandatory flow down to subcontractors. Anecdotal evidence is that many small businesses are not complying with the DFARS compliance at this time. The Department of Justice appears to be aware of this and views this whole issue where companies have submitted proposals or issued invoices implicitly stating they were compliant as the new Medicare fraud cases. DOD for a time had requested DOJ hold off on going after these companies. That time has clearly ended. And according to comments made by Ellen Lord, the DOD Undersecretary for Acquisition and Sustainment, DOD intends to auditing companies' cybersecurity procedures if they want to win contracts, and it plans to start within the next 18 months. There's also going to be new cybersecurity standards for which companies will have to abide by if they want to work for the military. And this is what she had to say. We have set out an objective of coming up with new cybersecurity standards this year, she told the Atlantic Council event on March 25th in Washington. Quote, we'll have metrics by which to measure them. We'll have third parties that can actually audit against them, such as the International Organization for Standardization Standards we have for quality. We need to them to understand how do we put cybersecurity into the new networks we are building? How do we make sure there aren't back doors there? How do we make sure that data at rest stays secure? Note that these new cybersecurity standards are looking to go beyond the current SP 800-171 standards. Just a little hint of advice for anyone who is not compliant at this point because you don't think you've had this data and you should check your contracts. If you get this clause added to your contract at, this at any point in time, you should set up a separate charge number and you can charge the effort to become compliant um, to the government as a change to your contract. If you, however, if you've submitted a proposal that basically indicated you were already compliant, one, you need to become compliant sooner rather than later, obviously. But at the same time, that's not all going to have to come out of your overhead efforts to become compliant. Next slide. Um, executive order in 2010, President Obama directed the executive branch to remove standardization and reduce conflicting guidance. It was to, it was all right now, there's a hundred forms of legacy markings. Um, it was to establish an open and uniform program for managing unclassified information. And it designated the, the National Archives and Record Administration as the executive agent. Next slide. This resulted in the NARA final rule at 32 CFR 2002. It became effective November 14, 2016. It applies to all agencies. It has some very specific guidance on the markings. Um, ultimately, though, the federal government is obligated to ensure the controlled information is shared with outside the government. Next slide. What's interesting is, is this standardization of 100 markings. They did not look at anything that was currently out there to see how, especially DOD was marking things. And the current marking looks nothing like theirs. It came up with a CUI registry that 23 discrete categories and 82 categories of CUI. Go ahead and go to the next slide so people can take a look at that while I finish talking about this. 
Um, it's to standardize the markings for CUI and mandate their use when disseminated outside the government. It was agencies are required to do this. Identify and establish the CUI decontrol authority and process. And it requires agencies to protect CUI using NIST standards, including the FIPS 199 and 800-50, special publication 853. And this gives you an eye of what the 23 CUI categories are. And under this, there's a bunch of subcategories. Next slide. When we have safeguarding, there's two basic ones, CUI basic, which is moderate. You can have the controls are low, moderate, and high. If you have low, then it is considered to be basically public information uh, or releasable to public, I guess I really should say. For contractors, the NIST 871 defines your, your requirements. If you have CUI specified, the Part 2I2 2 does not identify the specific recalls contrived, and it's up to the agency to provide that information to the contractors. Next slide. This gives you an idea of what the marking is supposed to look like. I will tell you right now, it is not being implemented, as far as I can tell, anywhere. Next slide. Finally, ultimately, the government's responsible for marking, but the absence of the marking doesn't eliminate the control requirement. If you're a contractor handling controlled information, you're expected to know what is, what is controlled, and if you're in doubt, you need to contact the disseminating agency, and if you, you're the holder or you're the creator of the information, you can challenge this, the designation. The takeaway here is, is the biggest issue is the government does not know what it thinks is CUI. It expects the contractor to know what CUI, and that is a big stretch. Contracting offices have been taking the easy way out, including the clauses in all contracts, but then to fail to designate what is considered to be CUI subject to protection. Um, this is a major issue. Once again, it's one primarily of training, and it's one that I think that we're going to see a lot more push going on within the federal government, DOD, as well as the agencies to become more compliant with, quite frankly, their own laws. And I apologize for going a couple minutes over, but that does conclude um, today's presentation. Thank you, Jody, for sharing your knowledge and insight today. Today's presentation has been recorded and can be found on our website or YouTube channel within about 48 hours. If you have questions about today's topic, please contact Jody at the phone number or email shown on your screen. Thank you, everybody. This concludes the webinar.